Ah, okay. How how are you? Eh? Fine, thank you. Good. I think uh, we can start the session. We're almost halfway and we cannot wait. Okay. Uh, in the previous lesson, uh, we have discussed about renal insufficiency, uh, like we have seen the overview, general overview of renal insufficiency. So today, uh, let me try like uh, briefly take you through what we have discussed in the previous lesson. Then I will actually discuss the clinical presentation, diagnosis and treatment modalities of renal insufficiency. So if you remember very well, we have discussed about the types of renal or classifications of renal insufficiency, the primary, secondary, and tertiary one. Primary is due to distraction from the gland itself, and secondary one is mainly due to uh, the problem from the anterior uh, pituitary gland. And tertiary one is mainly from the hypothalamus. So we have seen uh, the most common cause of primary a renal insufficiency is usually an anatomic condition, especially in developed countries. And the clinical presentation is usually observed uh, when a patient is having like significant destruction of the gland, which is above uh, 90%. Uh, then we have also mentioned about uh, the primary, in case of primary renal insufficiency, uh, the patient will encounter having aldosterone and uh, androgen uh, deficiency as well because uh, uh, the, because of like the glandular destruction, uh, the sites are usually destructed as a result of uh, the, uh, the different causes. Uh, so uh, in case of other types of renal insufficiency, uh, like in case of secondary and tertiary, uh, we don't re really see any significant problem in the second and the uh, level of aldosterone. I think aldosterone production is mainly depend on the RAS system. So the RAS system is the one which regulates. That is why it is not affected by uh, uh, in case of secondary and tertiary renal insufficiency. And we mentioned even this one in the previous lesson. Okay, uh, then we have seen also uh, chronic insufficiency is very rare and mostly very common uh, in a third and fifth decade of uh, life. Okay, uh, we have also seen the, the probable, most probable etiology of renal insufficiency. So autoimmune condition is like the most common cause in developed countries, but in developing countries like uh, uh, tuberculosis infection is uh, the most common cause of uh, renal insufficiency. But of course, even a HIV infection can also cause. I mentioned also other causes such as medication, uh, like uh, ketoconazole, which inhibits the synthesis, and the other which accelerates uh, the metabolism of cortisol in the serum. And we have also mentioned about congenital adrenal hyper hypoplasia uh, due to 21 adoxylase deficiency, which is very important enzyme in the production of uh, cortisol. Okay, uh, then we have also seen about the etiologies of uh, secondary renal insufficiency. So this one is mainly uh, the problem in, in the hypothalamus and uh, uh, also hypothyroidism and long term use of corticosteroids are the one which is responsible to cause secondary renal insufficiency. And we have also mentioned about uh, the tertiary causes, uh, mostly hypothalamic failure. It can also be like drug induced, like it suddenly withdraw after chronic administration of suprafidulic dose of glucocorticoids, uh, the patient will encounter tertiary renal insufficiency. So having said this much about the introductory session, now let us see the other aspects of renal insufficiency. Uh, let's start first with the clinical features. So when you look at the clinical features of renal insufficiency, weakness and fatigue is very are very common because if the kidney is not able to, if the adrenal gland is not able to uh, produce sufficient level of glucose as a result of a stressful event, uh, we are the patient will encounter having weakness and fatigue is very, uh, very common. And also, even nausea, anorexia, and the hair is also trouble. 
the common presentation uh, when a patient is having a renal insufficiency, but also hypoglycemic episode is also very, very common. So why hypoglycemia when a patient is having a renal insufficiency? Why hypoglycemia is common finding? Anna, what do you think? I feel like there is more glucose which will be excreted. So there'll be such a small amount which is being reabsorbed. So do you think like uh, a renal insufficiency will be associated with uh, excretion of glucose? Any other person? What causes hypoglycemia, Joan? In case of adrenal insufficiency? Um, can you say the increased release of cortisol? Increased release of cortisol? Uh -huh. I'm not sure. OK, Vivian? I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, then who is this? Tiffany? Yes, sir. So, what is the cause of hypoglycemia when a patient is having a renal insufficiency? Could it have anything to do with um, cortisol being uh, the decreased amount of cortisol that is necessary for? Um, mediating insulin action. I don't know, maybe peripheral tissues become more sensitive to action of insulin. So you get reduced blood sugar. I'm not sure, I'm just trying. Okay, uh, if you remember what we have discussed about the role of steroids in glucose metabolism, mostly they are very important to promote gluconeogenesis. When there is an insufficient, when there is a deficiency of sugar in the serum. So, if someone is having low cortisol means, like the endogenous production of, the endogenous production of glucose from the liver will be significantly reduced. Because you cannot actually eat the whole day. So like you eat, then the endogenous system will complement in case of deficiency. So if there is a deficiency means like the endogenous system will not be working. So the probability of having hypoglycemic episode will be very high if there is a deficiency because uh, like uh, cortisol is the main uh, hormone which promotes synthesis of glucose in the body system. But of course, the other catecholamines will work as well. But glucocorticoid is like the principal. That is why the name, uh, the name glucose comes from. It's just sugar or glucose because it is mainly promoting uh, level of increase the level of glucose uh, by endogenous production from the liver. Okay, so hypoglycemia is very fatal. Remember, especially when a patient is having hypoglycemia in the brain means like the brain tissue is mainly depending on the sugar or glucose. So if low sugar means the patient will actually die of hypoglycemic shock. Okay, so it can also affect the menstrual cycle. So the patient can have amenorrhea, uh, craving for salt like a strong desire to, uh, to take, the salt is very high. Uh, this is mainly due to aldosterone deficiency, secondary to primary renal insufficiency. Remember, the role of aldosterone is sodium and water retention. So if sodium and water is not retained, means the patient will not actually have a craving for salt, which is very common due to aldosterone deficiency. Weight loss is associated with fluid retention. Remember, uh, glucocorticoids are very important to actually gain weight. So, uh, sodium and water, if there is no sodium retention, is not retained, definitely weight loss and hypotension and even dehydration will actually can happen as a result of what? A renal insufficiency. Then, especially the dehydration 
the hypovolemia and hyperkalemia is mostly predominant in the primary renal insufficiency where the level of aldosterone is affected. So like as I said before, in case of primary renal insufficiency, like all or all the regions of uh, renal gland will be affected. Uh, mostly when you say renal uh, insufficiency by the we're referring like abnormal production of the uh, the cortex or the any problem in the cortex region, not in the middle region. That is uh, when we are going to say renal insufficiency. Okay, so then uh, when you look at even the sodium level and the chloride level is usually very low. Uh, this is very common in case of primary renal insufficiency. Then as a result of dehydration, now the kidney function will be compromised. Remember, if the kidney is not perfused adequately, uh, you will encounter uh, acute kidney injury. This is actually because of central hypovolemia. So the blood urea nitrogen creatinine level will be elevated as a result of uh, dehydration. Then of course, hyperpigmentation of the skin. Remember, there are several causes that causes hyperpigmentation of the skin. One is primary renal insufficiency, the other part is pregnancy. Pregnancy can actually cause hyperpigmentation of the skin because pregnancy increases what? Increases the level of melanin. And even use of oral contraceptive, the hormonal type increases hyperpigmentation. That is why uh, in this area, I don't know whether you have observed it. If, you, if someone is actually a long-term contraceptive user, you'll see some kind of butterfly markers from both sides of the face uh, around the nose, which is very common. You can actually even notice, so most likely that mother is a most likely contraceptive user. I don't know whether you came across, but this hyperpigmentation is as a result of the contraceptive increases the melanin production and this causes pigmentation of the skin. And even in pregnancy is very common, is mostly in the oral areas in the lips. Uh, you will see like, uh, uh, marked darkening of the skin is very common, even around the neck region is very common uh, because of pregnancy-related uh, melanin production. Okay, uh, so uh, in, in this case, what really causes hyperpigmentation is due to high level of ACTH. Remember, ACTH can increase the level of melanin production by activating the melanocyte stimulating hormone from the, uh, I think from the anterior epistery. So when a patient is actually having primary renal insufficiency, remember when there is a problem in the gland itself, now the anterior epistery will produce more of the ACTH at the compensatory response. So this increase of ACTH can actually increase the level of uh, melanin production the level of melanin production. So this is a, that, that is why hyperpigmentation of the skin is a common finding in case of primary renal insufficiency. Then in case of primary renal insufficiency, even there's loss of axillary and pubic care is in women owing to decreased androgen production. Due to androgen production, uh, then uh, like loss of uh, axillary and pubic care is very common in one in woman uh, that is very very common because the only source of androgen in female is is a renal gland so if there is a problem in the gland itself means now uh, loss of hair uh, will happen okay uh, then having said this much about the diagnostic uh, the clinical parameters uh, or the clinical features of a renal insufficiency now let us see how do we came up with the diagnosis of uh, renal insufficiency. Then one, uh, we can look at hyperpigmentation of the skin. As I mentioned before, hyperpigmentation is very common in primary renal insufficiency, but in case of secondary and tertiary, the, the, there is low level of ACTH. So because of low level of ACTH, even the melanin level will be low. So hyperpigmentation will happen. Like you will see pale colored skin 
uh, will happen in case of hypo, uh, in case of secondary or uh, tertiary adrenal insufficiency. So uh, you have to look at even the color of the skin. But remember, there is a possibility of depigmentation because of vitiligo. So I think that one we'll see when we are discussing about skin disorder. Okay, then uh, other diagnostic parameter that should be considered is you have to measure the level of cortisol in the serum. That is very important. Also, look at the level of aldosterone in the serum, which is mainly reduced in case of primary renal insufficiency. By the way, as a result of low level of aldosterone, usually the plasma level of renin is uh, very, very high or very high in cases of what? In case of primary renal insufficiency. Then and there is SETH stimulation test. SETH stimulation test entails injection of SETH, the new measure, the level of cortisol and aldosterone after SETH stimulation. So if the level of cortisol is normal, if the level of like the baseline cortisol, like before and after, like the baseline and after administration, if there is no change, definitely the problem is from the gland itself. If there is an increase in cortisol level after SETH stimulation test, it will tell us the problem is actually from the anterior pituitary or secondary, secondary renal insufficiency. So this is another uh, mechanism, but mostly the serum level of cortisol and aldosterone is the most common cases that can be considered in case of renal insufficiency. Uh, then the other uh, thing we need to know uh, is about uh, the CT scan of the gland, the pituitary and the hypothalamus should be done, then it will tell us uh, where is the source of the problem. Then of course we can do anti-adrenal antibody test that will suggest whether the patient is having any autoimmune condition or not. So those are the tests. But how do we differentiate whether the patient is having primary, secondary, or tertiary insufficiency? So look at the plasma level of aldosterone and the plasma level of SETH concentration. Aldosterone level is usually low in case of primary, but in case of secondary, it is usually normal. The level of plasma SETH in case of primary, it is usually very high as a result of positive feedback mechanism. Then in case of secondary and tertiary, the plasma level of SETH is usually low. low. So that is how we are going to know. It is just a simple test to know whether the problem is actually from the uh, secondary or central cause or uh, peripheral cause from the gland itself. So those are the most common tests that can tell us whether the patient is primary, secondary, uh, insufficiency. In fact, for tertiary insufficiency, uh, there is corticotropin releasing hormone, uh, releasing hormone stimulation test. You give TRH, if the level of SETH is high, you give CRH, and then if the level of SETH is high, it will tell us the problem is actually if the level of SETH is high after stimulation of CRH, the problem will be from the hypothalamus. If there is no any change, it will tell us the problem is from the anterior pituitary. So this CRH stimulation test is the common test to differentiate whether it is secondary or tertiary renal insufficiency. But the aldosterone level of and plasma SETH level will tell us to differentiate whether the problem is either secondary, primary, or other uh, secondary tertiary causes of renal insufficiency. Okay, uh, so this is all about the diagnosis, the clinical feature, and the overview of renal insufficiency. So now let us see about the treatment modalities of renal insufficiency. The goal is to manage the symptoms and to prevent the development of renal 
crisis. So those are uh, the treatment uh, or the goals of uh, treatment when a patient is having uh, this problem. But let me, let me ask you a question. Question, Merci. No, no question, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, how do we manage renal insufficiency? How do we manage renal insufficiency? What is your opinion about the management of this condition? Remember, the problem is just insufficiency of the hormone. So the, the treatment the modalities... Hormone will, replacement. Yeah, that is the only treatment modalities we're having. So like the best treatment strategy in case of renal insufficiency is replacement of the hormone. In case of chronic, it is just a chronic condition. So the patient is having lifelong renal insufficiency. So lifelong glucocorticoid replacement therapy will be recommended. But remember, the major risk of long-term uh, glucocorticoid replacement therapy. So like the possibility of uh, immune suppression, possibility of uh, the result, the patient will have uh, infection or recurrent infection, a very common and cause bridging of the skin, like all the features of Cushing syndrome will happen after, like when we give excessive dose of uh, glucocorticoid and when we give uh, like a long-term replacement. Okay, uh, so here, uh, uh, glucocorticoid with sufficient mineralocorticoid activity is generally recommended. But remember, in the, at the beginning of this session, uh, like at the beginning of adrenal gland disorder, I mentioned about the different types of glucocorticoids, like depending on the, the potency, as well as depending on the mineral corticoid activity. But remember, glucocorticoids, they do have some mineral corticoid activities, but they really vary in terms of uh, activity. For example, the most commonly available glucocorticoid is hydrocortisone. Hydro, hydrocortisone. So this hydrocortisone is the most widely used. And in terms of it is mineral corticoid activity, hydrocortisone is the superior among all other, among all uh, glucocorticoids. But like the longer, like the newer acting glucocorticoids such as like the dexamethasone, thymicinolone, they are they almost have zero or no problem to cause fluid and water retention. So like their, uh, their level to cause or their mineral corticoid activity is almost nil, almost nil. That is why when a patient is supposed to be on a steroid treatment and having any cardiovascular disorder, we have to check whether they do have a potential to cause fluid retention. So like when a patient is supposed to be, uh, supposed to uh, take steroid, having maybe heart failure, like the long acting, like the dexamethasone might be preferred if they're available because the probability of causing water and, and fluid retention is very minimal. So that is why you, you need to identify the potency of uh, different glucocorticoids, uh, like in terms of uh, causing fluid retention. So hydrocortisone is uh, mostly resembled with endogenous cortisol. Yeah, because of high mineral corticoid activity and short half life time. So it is most likely uh, mimicking the endogenous cortisol. Then treatment wise, hydrocortisone replacement therapy is the most common used in both primary, secondary, and tertiary insufficiency. Then the most common adult dose we can give for primary insufficiency is 15 to 25 milligram daily dose orally in two divided doses. So these two divided doses usually, high dose like two-third 
of the doses are usually given in the morning and the lower dose will be given in the evening. So maybe, can you tell me the reason why we give high dose of uh, the hydrocortisone in the morning and low dose in the evening and not on the other way around? What do you think about the possible reason of giving high dose of steroids in the morning? What do you think? Five mark question. Eh? Tell me, I don't know who is speaking. I have to see the chat. Uh, like, who is talking? It's Mercy. Mercy, yeah. Huh? I think to avoid insomnia. To avoid insomnia. So you give high dose in the morning. Yeah, that is one reason. But the steroids, they can actually affect like the sleep-wake cycle and causes insomnia. So you better give, if a patient is supposed to take one daily dose of a steroid, you better take in the morning before 9 a.m. So one is to avoid insomnia, risk of insomnia. Is there any other reason why we give high dose in the morning? Because endogenous cortisol production um, follows the same pattern such that there's increased production during the day and it lowers at night. Exactly. It, it actually mimics the endogenous production of cortisol. Like remember the cortisol production usually like between 2 a.m. and like 8 a.m. in the morning, like before 9, it usually peak, it start raise, raising from 2 a.m. and it actually reaches to peak point around 9 a.m., like before 9 a.m. So usually the peak point is like 8 a.m. So it mimics the endogenous production. So remember, the probability of suppression of the HPA axis is usually very minimal, very minimal. When you give steroids, when we give exogenous corticosteroids, when the level of endogenous cortisol level is reaching at the peak point, that is 8 a.m. in the morning. So the probability of suppression will be very minimal. But otherwise, in the other day of the day, like other time of the day, if you give them, the probability of suppression will be very high. So that is why uh, mimicking the endogenous production will affect, it has actually have the least effect to call HP axis suppression. So that is the main reason why we give high dose in the morning and low dose in the evening. If you give high dose in the evening, they cannot sleep. So it will affect the sleep pattern as well. And of course, it can actually even cause significant suppression of the HP axis. So because of those two reasons, high dose is usually given uh, in the morning, low dose in the evening. But they even exogenous insulin administration follow the same pattern. I think that one I will come on Wednesday where we give high dose of insulin in the morning and low dose in the evening. I don't know whether you encounter a diabetic patient huh? who is taking like insulin injection. Is there anyone who came across how many units of insulin they are taking in the morning and how many taking in the evening? Is there anyone who came across? Diabetes is very common. Huh? Okay, that means you didn't come across. Huh? Okay, anyways, I will come to that point where we give high dose of insulin in the morning and high dose. Usually like two thirds in the morning, like one third in the evening. Yeah, but I will come when we are starting uh, discussing about uh, DM. The long acting glucocorticoid can be considered, but uh, the major issue here from here is uh, they might not have uh, mineral corticoid activity. So, uh, that is a major issue, but they can be used in ways. But hydrocortisone is the most commonly used. 
Then uh, oral fludrocortisone uh, daily dose might be required in case of primary renal insufficiency. Then maintain adequate sodium intake is very important because in the case of primary renal insufficiency, even hyponatremia is a common finding. So you have to give adequate amount of intake that is a recommended dose is usually recommended. Okay, uh, what, what is the difference between the treatment of secondary and tertiary renal insufficiency? The treatment is identical, except we don't need mineral corticoid replacement in majority of the cases because aldosterone production is not affected. That is the difference and mostly a lower dose is usually required in case of tertiary and secondary causes like 2 to 15 a milligram per meter square is most commonly recommended for secondary tertiary. And even sometimes it is not lifelong. The treatment might not be lifelong in case of tertiary. For example, in case of drug-induced insufficiency, we just give a replacement until the HP axis restore. Then after that, when the HP axis restore, we just taper the dose and we withdraw the medicine. Yeah, initially we just withdraw. The patient has already had drug-induced insufficiency, so you start the medication. Then, after that, when the, the HP axis is restored, we just discontinue slowly. That is the, the, the difference. So, we, we don't need mineral corticoid replacement therapy. Lower doses are required, and sometimes lifelong glucocorticoid replacement therapy might not be required. One typical example is drug induced renal insufficiency. Okay, now how do we monitor? The patient is supposed to be at least uh, six to eight weeks of treatment. Then you monitor the weight, blood pressure, and the serum level of electrolyte. That is very, very important. Then uh, mostly the end, uh, point of therapy is difficult to assess in majority of the patient, but when there is a reduction in the pigmentation of the skin, this is a good clinical marker. The, the pigmentation will go away as we treat the patient because it actually reduces the production of uh, melanin. Then the development of features of Cushing syndrome will indicate we have then excessive replacement. So anyways, uh, the assessing the glucocorticoid level every two, six to eight weeks and uh, monitoring those electrolyte levels are very, uh, very important uh, in case of uh, chronic replacement uh, therapy. Then now, uh, let me take you through about acute renal insufficiency. We call it a renal crisis. So this crisis is usually result is from when the body is not able to, to increase the level of endogenous cortisol uh, during the uh, physiological stress. So when a patient is having excessive physiological stress, they might not able to achieve the body demand to resolve the stress in terms of getting the desired energy uh, from uh, the adrenal hormone. So it can even occur in chronic uh, patient when excessive replacement is not, when adequate replacement is not done in case of a stressful condition such as surgery, infection, and acute illness. Remember, uh, those stress hormones are very important to relieve stressful event uh, in case of uh, this condition. So uh, that is why uh, this is another uh, cause of acute renal insufficiency. Then it can actually result this from bilateral renal infarction, so in case of embolus, hemorrhage, and even in case of uh, infection, it can actually even happen. Then also it can happen when we abruptly discontinue any glucocorticoid administration. That is why when you notice a patient has been on a chronic glucocorticoid treatment, abrupt discontinuation can cause a renal crisis. And we'll actually see what will happen if there is a renal crisis 
even the patient will develop circulatory collapse or shock because of hypotension. So that is why uh, uh, renal acute renal insufficiency is very, uh, very, it's just one of the medical emergencies that should require immediate intervention. So what are the clinical features of acute renal insufficiency? By the way, the clinical features are similar to that of the chronic renal insufficiency. But the difference is like the onset is very acute and it is usually precipitated by excessive physiological stress and the severity of the condition is uh, very high in case of acute condition. Severe fatigue and severe weakness, severe abdominal pain and density, and even severe dehydration that leads to hypotension and shock. We call it circulatory collapse. Then sometimes even the hypovolemia might not be responsive to IV. Hydration, hypoglycemia, because of electrolyte imbalance, the confusion due to hypoglycemia, uh, and even the confusion comes in because of hyponatemia. So you'll see those are the major clinical presentations. So we have to correct the volume depletion and we have to manage the hypoglycemia and provide glucocorticoid replacement immediately. Otherwise, the patient will die of circulatory collapse. If so, how do we treat the acute condition? Volume depletion and hypoglycemia should be corrected by giving normal saline with extra solution. Then followed by glucocorticoid replacement therapy, and we usually uh, prefer intravenous of administration because of the urgency of the condition. So what dose 100 milligram every six hours for the first 24 hours, then you assess the patient. If the patient is stable, we can decrease the dose to 50 milligram. Then after that, we can even taper to 30 milligram after like four to five days of therapy. That is the recommendation. So that is how we're treating acute adrenal insufficiency. Give normal saline with dextro, then you replace intravenous hydrocortisone. And sometimes even a fludrocortisone can be needed or can be added uh, when necessary, uh, depending on the patient condition. So now, any questions so far? Maybe let me receive any question. Any questions so far? Okay, fine. So uh, now, uh, Sir, the, yes. Um, I didn't completely get what was the cause of acute adrenal insufficiency exactly. I just had something about excessive physiological stress. No, uh, yeah, the exact cause of acute condition could be. Someone might have a chronic condition, but adequate replacement is not given, or uh, when a patient is actually having any other stressful condition, like infection as a result, the patient actually developed infection while he was on chronic can actually cause. Then what is most common in the clinical setting in acute renal insufficiency is added withdrawal of Supraphysiologic dose of supraphysiologic dose of uh, glucocorticoid. For example, a patient with SLE has been on long-term use of steroid, and if we suddenly step stop the medication, the patient can develop acute renal insufficiency. So it can even it can even caused by infection. It can even cause by when there is impaction of the renal gland in its C. But what is very common is, what is very common uh, cause of acute renal insufficiency is abrupt discontinuation uh, of chronically administered uh, glucocorticoid. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes, you did. Okay, fine. Now, if you don't have any other question, uh, let us uh, read the case study. 
for one uh, two minutes. Huh? Then we will discuss together. Then after that, I do have a short video about the summary of renal insufficiency, and that will be the end of renal gland disorder. Okay, so read the question independently for two minutes, then I will get back to you after two minutes. Okay, fine. So maybe he was willing to give us a summary of the case study. Any volunteer? Any volunteer? Christine, can you try? Christine? Okay, we answer. Dorothy, okay. Dorothy, are you available? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for your response. Huh? Just give us uh, like the summary of the case study, then we see it together. Okay. So uh, this is a 48-year-old woman, and uh, her main presenting complaint is fatigue, and she's assuming that it's because of low vitamins but she's and she's also experiencing tiredness which are the common symptoms of adrenal insufficiency and then she also complains of dizziness especially with positional changes so most probably there is postural hypotension which is also one of the symptoms of adrenal insufficiency and then intermittent nausea abdominal pain and diarrhea then her past medical history, she had uh, TB, but she completed the full treatment course. She has a history of candidal vaginitis and depression. And her mother uh, had type 1 diabetes. So she probably could be having the same issue because it's familial history. Then she denies smoking alcohol use and illicit drug use. So her current medications are sertraline, 
I'm not sure about this one, but I think it's for the depression. Then loperamide is because she's been experiencing diarrhea, so she takes it as needed. Then her physical examination reveals a sitting blood pressure of 106 over 68, which is low. Her pulse rate is 74, which is within the normal. And her standing BP is very low, which could be postural hypertension. Her respiratory rate, I think, is normal. And she weighs 59 kgs. Okay, then also weight loss of 2.3 kg. Okay, good. Then? Uh, for skin physical examination, she has hypopigmentation, which is attributable to ACTH. And then her cardiovascular system is normal. Then her labs, her serum electrolyte, sodium... I'm not sure if this is high or low. Low. The normal sodium is 135 to 145 milli equivalent per liter. It is this hyponatremia. That's slight derangement. And her potassium level is on the upper range. Mm -hmm. And then uh, her blood nitrogen urea is high. Okay. And uh, her glucose levels are low. Yes. yes, her glucose levels are low. So maybe can you like attempt the question number one? Any sign and symptoms of renal insufficiency in summary? Uh, so the main symptom, the fatigue, and that's the common symptom. And then there was hypopigmentation. Mm -hmm. Then uh, uh, from the labs, there was high blood urea nitrogen and hyponatremia and hyperkalemia. Okay. Huh? And then hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia, okay. Thank you. Okay. I think, yeah, thank you so much. And that is enough for you. Then any other person? Does her presentation offer any clue as, a, as to etiology or classification of RNA insufficiency? Was there any clue? Joan Muruki? Yes. So what do you think? Was there any clue about the etiology of her condition from the, from the presentation? Oh, you have no idea. Okay. Uh, oh, Alan, you want to try? You can try. Can we say due to her tuberculosis, that's why she might have had primary, uh, primary that she had uh, a history of tuberculosis. Oh, exactly. So it can be one possibility because like in developing country, they think TB infection is one of the most common cause of renal insufficiency. So that can be a possible causes. Okay, good. That is one observation that will tell us the etiology and also the classification of arena, which is primary. Okay, any other, any other condition? That um, the hyponatremia and hyperpigmentation. So the hyponatremia would show that she has a aldosterone issue and the hyperpigmentation could show um, ACTH, increase in ACTH levels that is also seen in primary um, adrenal insufficiency. Uh, exactly, so those are like some of the condition, uh, hyperpigmentation, which is very common and even uh, like uh, hyponatremia, which is also very common in case of like primary renal insufficiency. 
uh, which is uh, another uh, possible option. Okay, good. Uh, then what about family history of type 1 DM? Remember, by the way, like if someone is having autoimmune condition or maybe type 1, by the way, the probability of inheritance is very unlikely, but it can be. Type 2 is more of inherited type of DM, but type 1 also. So type 1 is just an autoimmune destruction. The major cause of type 1 DM is just autoimmune condition. So most likely this patient has a family history of autoimmune condition. So he might have, she might have even a family history because it's like the, the history is like, or the history is from the first degree relative, that is her mother. So because of that reason, uh, there is a possibility of having an autoimmune condition that leads to a primary destruction of the, the gland. So those are the three options that gives us a clue about the etiology of a condition. Then lastly, which tests would be most useful for determining the etiology and confirming the diagnosis of renal insufficiency for this patient? Any other person? Makina, can you try if you are available? Eh? Okay, Anita. Okay, fine. So because of time, we're supposed to do what? We're supposed to do the plasma level of aldosterone. We have to look at the plasma level of ACTH and we have to look at even the plasma level of cortisol. So those are uh, the most common tests uh, that should be done uh, to identify or to confirm the diagnosis of renal insufficiency, as well as even the etiology. Of course, we even we can do a CT scan or imaging to find out whether there is a tumor that in a gland or in the uh, anterior uh, pituitary gland. So uh, this is all about uh, what I have from my side, uh, this renal gland. Uh, disorders. Any question? Any question? Okay, fine. So, uh, members, in the next few minutes, I'm going to uh, show you, I'm going to actually share a video uh, so that you can actually uh, watch uh, properly. It's very like a uh, very informative uh, video because I have seen it even myself. Uh, then that will be the end of the session. Uh, let me share. While doing your rounds, you see two individuals. First is Mike, a 50-year-old immigrant from Canada who comes in with a five-month history of progressive fatigue, weight loss, and muscle pain. Personal history is unremarkable, but there's a family history of autoimmune disease. Examination reveals hypotension and diffuse skin hyperpigmentation most pronounced around the oral mucosa, palmar creases, and knuckles. Then you see Teresa, a 25-year-old who presents with acute vomiting, abdominal pain, and fever. She was accompanied by her mother, who mentions Teresa recently underwent transphenoidal resection of a pituitary tumor. Examination reveals severe hypotension and altered mental status. Morning cortisol serum measurements show decreased levels of serum cortisol in both individuals. Both people have adrenal insufficiency although their symptoms are very different. 
Now, adrenal insufficiency is a condition where the adrenal glands don't produce enough adrenal hormones, particularly cortisol and sometimes aldosterone. There are actually three types of adrenal insufficiency. First, primary adrenal insufficiency is when there's a problem with the adrenal glands themselves. As a result, both cortisol and aldosterone production is deficient. It can be acute, usually due to a massive adrenal hemorrhage, or chronic, in which case it's called Addison disease. Now, a high-yield concept to remember is that the most common cause for Addison in high-income countries is autoimmune-mediated damage to the adrenal glands. In the rest of the world, the most common cause is infection, especially from tuberculosis but it can also be due to HIV or disseminated fungal infections. Finally, bilateral adrenal metastases of cancer from somewhere else in the body can also cause chronic adrenal insufficiency. Then there's central adrenal insufficiency, which can be secondary or tertiary. In secondary adrenal insufficiency, the problem is not with the adrenal glands, but with the pituitary, which secretes insufficient ACTH. And since ACTH only regulates cortisol production, in this case, there's cortisol deficiency, but aldosterone levels are normal. This can happen with panhypopituitarism, when the entire pituitary gland is affected, and all the hormones secreted by it are deficient. Panhypopituitarism can be a result of any condition that affects the entire pituitary, like trauma, and pituitary tumors or large central nervous system tumors in its vicinity. And finally, there's tertiary adrenal insufficiency, where the problem originates with the hypothalamus and there's insufficient CRH secretion. So, once again, because there's no CRH to stimulate the pituitary to release ACTH, the adrenal glands won't produce cortisol. And because CRH doesn't influence its production, aldosterone levels are normal. Similar to secondary adrenal insufficiency, this can happen because of head trauma or intracranial tumors. However, tertiary adrenal insufficiency is usually caused by sudden withdrawal of chronic glucocorticoid therapy and resolution of Cushing syndrome, which suppresses hypothalamic production of CRH through negative feedback. Now, when it comes to symptoms, adrenal insufficiency can be acute or chronic. The acute presentation is high yield and is called adrenal crisis. This typically occurs when the body is under stress, like when the person is ill or has just undergone surgery, and the adrenal glands can't meet the increased demand for cortisol. An adrenal crisis presents with hypotension or shock, vomiting, abdominal pain, fever, and mental status changes ranging from confusion to coma. The chronic presentation is more insidious. Some symptoms are nonspecific, like fatigue, anorexia, and weight loss, weakness, abdominal pain, and muscle and joint pain. Sometimes, these can go unnoticed because the body can partially compensate for low levels of cortisol and aldosterone. Sometimes, people with Addison disease can present with adrenal crisis when they're under stress. All right, moving on. There are some symptoms specific to each type of insufficiency as well. In primary adrenal insufficiency, you need to know that there's hyperpigmentation, especially around the oral mucosa, palmar creases, and knuckles. Hyperpigmentation is caused by increased production of melanin due to a surge in melanocyte-stimulating hormone, or MSH, levels. This is because MSH is a byproduct of increased ACTH production since both have a common precursor called propiomelanocortin. There can also be a salt craving if aldosterone is deficient. Hyponatremia and hyponatremic volume contraction can also develop when aldosterone levels drop since aldosterone normally enhances sodium reabsorption. The main result of volume contraction is hypotension. Another major function of aldosterone is to increase urinary potassium secretion, and without it, the kidneys won't be able to get rid of excess potassium, which causes hyperkalemia, and subsequently, metabolic acidosis. Additionally, on your test, there might also be either a personal or a family history of autoimmune disease, like diabetes or Hashimoto thyroiditis, which are commonly associated with autoimmune Addison disease. Now, in secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency, because there's no ACTH excess and aldosterone levels are normal, individuals won't present with hyperpigmentation or hyperkalemia. However, they might have symptoms pertaining to the underlying cause of insufficiency, such as headaches, visual abnormalities like bitemporal hemianopia, and features of hypopituitarism in those with pituitary tumors. 
Others might have a history of prolonged glucocorticoid treatment. Adrenal insufficiency diagnosis is also very high yield. Testing begins with a morning or random serum cortisol measurement, where a low cortisol level confirms adrenal insufficiency. Now, if there's adrenal insufficiency, serum ACTH levels should also be tested. If it's high, it suggests primary adrenal insufficiency, whereas if serum ACTH is low, it suggests a central cause, either secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Next, an ACTH stimulation test can help confirm the diagnosis when the morning cortisol level is inconclusive, and it can also help differentiate between primary and central disease. In this test, the individual is given cosentropin, which is a synthetic analog of ACTH, and serum cortisol levels are measured before and after the analog is given. Low cortisol levels before and after cosentropin administration confirm primary adrenal insufficiency because adrenal pathology prevents the release of cortisol. In contrast, if cortisol levels rise following cosentropin administration, that means the adrenals are responding properly to ACTH or its analog, confirming central adrenal deficiency, meaning the issue is either with the pituitary or the hypothalamus. Now, if this test is also inconclusive, a metyrapone stimulation test can be performed. Metyrapone is a drug that blocks the conversion of a precursor called 11-deoxycortisol to cortisol, and the test is based upon the principle that decreasing serum cortisol concentrations will result in an increase in ACTH if the pituitary and hypothalamus are normal. So, if after the test ACTH levels are high, but 11-deoxycortisol levels are decreased, that confirms primary adrenal insufficiency. If both ACTH and 11-deoxycortisol are decreased, that is suggestive of secondary or tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Next, if we suspect primary insufficiency, then serum aldosterone and plasma renin activity should also be obtained. Renin normally stimulates aldosterone release, so with primary adrenal insufficiency, there will be low aldosterone and high plasma renin activity. On the other hand, if there's a central cause, then a CRH stimulation test can be done to differentiate between secondary and tertiary disease. That's where an individual is given a CRH injection and ACT is measured before and after. No rise in serum ACTH compared to the basal value points to a pituitary or secondary cause, and if serum ACTH increases, then the hypothalamus is to blame. So, it's tertiary adrenal insufficiency. Treatment for adrenal insufficiency consists of lifelong hormone replacement therapy with glucocorticoids, like hydrocortisone. Mineralocorticoids, like fludrocortisone, should also be added in cases of primary adrenal insufficiency with decreased aldosterone. Individuals should also be advised to wear a bracelet that mentions they have adrenal insufficiency in case of adrenal crisis. For this dangerous condition, treatment should be initiated as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed. In an emergency setting where an individual has severe hypotension, intravenous fluids and IV hydrocortisone, a synthetic corticosteroid, should be administered immediately. Now that we've covered the basics of adrenal insufficiency, let's talk about some specific causes. So, starting with primary adrenal insufficiency, or Addison disease, if the cause is autoimmune in nature, it's called autoimmune adrenalitis. This can occur on its own, or it can be a part of two inherited polyglandular autoimmune syndromes that affect different endocrine glands. Polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 1 is associated with Addison disease, hypoparathyroidism, and chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis, most commonly affecting the mouth, skin, and nails. These individuals often have primary hypogonadism, where the gonads are also damaged by autoantibodies. Polyglandular autoimmune syndrome type 2 is associated with Addison disease and autoimmune thyroiditis, in which case it's known as Schmidt syndrome. In addition, hypogonadism and type 1 diabetes mellitus may also be present. Autoimmune adrenalitis can be diagnosed by identifying elevated levels of serum anti-adrenal antibodies, particularly anti-21-hydroxylase. When it comes to Addison disease caused by an infection or malignancy, diagnosis is based on a workup which should include a chest x-ray and a tuberculin skin test to look for evidence of tuberculosis and, if confirmed, 
anti-tuberculosis medications can be given to treat the infection. Screening for HIV infection can be done with PCR or with antibody antigen tests. If an HIV infection is the confirmed cause, antiretroviral therapy should be initiated. Finally, a CT scan can also identify adrenal metastases, which most frequently come from lung, breast, stomach, and colon cancer, or lymphoma. In these cases, treatment with hydrocortisone and fludrocortisone should also be initiated before surgery or chemo and radiotherapy. Another rare cause of primary adrenal insufficiency is adrenoleukodystrophy, which is an inherited disease that predominantly affects young males. The condition is an X-linked recessive disorder. The defect is actually a mutation in the ABCD1 gene, and it interferes with fatty acid beta-oxidation. As a result, very long-chain fatty acids accumulate in various tissues, and they particularly affect the white matter of the brain, the adrenal cortex, and testes. So, besides adrenal insufficiency, they will also have neurological problems, like seizures, blindness, quadriparesis, and cognitive developmental delay. In severe cases, it can result in dementia, coma, and even death. Diagnosis begins with blood tests which show elevated plasma concentration of very long-chain fatty acids, or VLCFAs. In individuals with elevated VLCFAs, molecular genetic testing confirms the diagnosis, for which lifelong therapy with hydrocortisone is required. Another important cause of adrenal insufficiency is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, or CAH. This is a group of autosomal recessive diseases caused by mutations in the genes that encode the enzymes involved in cortisol and aldosterone biosynthesis. As a general note, if the deficient enzyme starts with 1, it causes hypertension, and if the deficient enzyme ends with 1, it causes virilization in females. When it comes to 21-hydroxylase deficiency, remember that 21-hydroxylase converts progesterone into 11-deoxycorticosterone, an aldosterone precursor, and 17-hydroxyprogesterone into 11-deoxycortisol, a cortisol precursor. Its impaired function leads to low levels of cortisol and aldosterone, and high levels of ACTH, resulting in adrenal gland hyperplasia. It also leads to excess production of androgen precursors, since their production is also regulated by ACTH. It's important to know that 21-hydroxylase deficiency can lead to three distinct syndromes depending on the residual activity of the enzyme. First is the classic salt-wasting type, which is caused by severe 21-hydroxylase deficiency. In this case, females present with ambiguous genitalia at birth due to excess androgen precursors, and males present with failure to thrive during the first one to two weeks. They can also have symptoms like dehydration, vomiting, and hypotension, mostly due to aldosterone deficiency. Second is the classic non-salt-wasting type, which is due to moderate 21-hydroxylase deficiency. This is when females develop ambiguous genitalia at birth and males develop signs of early virilization, like pubic hair, accelerated growth, and a large phallus at two to four years. And third, there's the non-classic delayed type, which is associated with mild enzyme deficiency. This is when school-age boys present with early onset of puberty or sexual prematurity, and in addition, females develop acne, hirsutism, and menstrual irregularity. Okay, so screening for 21-hydroxylase deficiency involves measuring serum levels of 17-hydroxyprogesterone, which are usually higher or very high in affected individuals due to them not being converted by 21-hydroxylase. In the salt-wasting type, another clue is that blood work might also show hyponatremia and hyperkalemia due to aldosterone deficiency. Other characteristic findings include decreased levels of mineralocorticoids and cortisol, increased levels of sex hormones, and decreased renin activity. And finally, something else to keep in mind is that treatment consists of hormonal replacement with gluco- and mineralocorticoids to suppress pituitary secretion of ACTH, which will also normalize androgen levels. Okay, so there are two more types of CAH to remember. First is 11-beta-hydroxylase deficiency, and this enzyme converts 11-deoxycorticosterone to corticosterone and 11-deoxycortisol to cortisol. 
It presents similarly to 21 hydroxylase deficiency, with the important difference being that it causes the accumulation of 11 deoxycorticosterone, a mild mineral acorticoid. This can lead to hypertension and hypokalemia, even though renin and aldosterone levels are low. And then there's 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency, which is very rare. The enzyme is active in both the adrenal gland and the gonads, where it converts pregnenolone to 17 hydroxypregnenolone and progesterone to 17 hydroxyprogesterone. This means 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency leads to impaired synthesis of androgens, estrogens, and cortisol, but does not affect mineral acorticoid production. On the contrary, high ACTH levels cause excessive production of 11 deoxycorticosterone and corticosterone, which are mineral acorticoids that cause hypertension. The clinical picture here is dominated by the lack of androgens in utero. This means males will have external genitalia that appear female at birth, without having any internal female genitalia, whereas females will have the typical internal and external female genitalia. Then, at puberty, due to low levels of sex hormones, male individuals won't develop secondary sex characteristics like body hair, breast enlargement, and voice deepening. Additionally, menstrual bleeding won't be triggered in females. Individuals might also experience symptoms suggestive of mineral acorticoid overproduction. When it comes to blood work, you can typically find decreased levels of aldosterone, cortisol, potassium, and renin activity, and increased levels of 11-deoxycorticosterone and sex hormones. In 17-alpha hydroxylase deficiency, however, there's increased levels of mineral acorticoids and decreased levels of cortisol, sex hormones, potassium, and androstenedione. As a quick summary of the three types of CAH, 21 hydroxylase deficiency and 11 beta hydroxylase deficiency cause females to develop ambiguous genitalia at birth, while 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency causes males to have external genitalia that appear female at birth. 11 beta hydroxylase and 17 alpha hydroxylase deficiency both cause hypertension, but 21 hydroxylase deficiency does not. Okay, let's move on. The last cause of primary adrenal insufficiency we'll go over is waterhouse Friderichsen syndrome. This is an acute syndrome caused by bilateral adrenal hemorrhage, usually associated with severe bacterial infection. Although many microbes can cause this, the most likely scenario to appear on your exams is severe septicemia due to Neisseria meningitidis infection. Key things to look for are disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC, endotoxic shock, petechial rash, and headache with neck stiffness if meningitis is also present. Diagnosis is based on clinical features of adrenal insufficiency as well as identifying the causative pathogen. If meningitis is suspected, a lumbar puncture is performed to obtain cerebrospinal fluid for analysis and culture. In all other instances, blood cultures should be obtained. Additionally, blood work could show a sudden fall in hemoglobin and hematocrit, leukocytosis and progressive hyperkalemia, hyponatremia, and volume contraction. Remember that DIC will cause thrombocytopenia and extremely elevated PT and PTT, with prothrombin time and partial thromboplastin time suggestive of disseminated intravascular coagulation. Treatment should be focused on correcting fluid, electrolyte, and hematological deficits as well as treating the infection with antibiotics. IV hydrocortisone can be used to address adrenal insufficiency. Okay, let's look at the causes of secondary adrenal insufficiency. The most common is a non-functional pituitary macroadenoma. This type of adenoma is a benign tumor of the pituitary greater than one centimeter. If the tumor is large enough, it can compress the normal pituitary tissue. So, in time, some or all of the pituitary hormones become deficient, which is called hypopituitarism. Regarding symptoms, the tumor can cause headaches, and as the tumor compresses on the nearby nerves, visual abnormalities. Individuals can also develop signs of adrenal insufficiency and hypopituitarism. Diagnosis is based on a head MRI to identify the tumor's size and location. 
and pituitary hormone serum measurements to look for hypopituitarism. Treatment is usually transphenoidal resection, which is when the tumor is removed through the nose. And finally, the more common tested causes of tertiary adrenal insufficiency are sudden withdrawal of glucocorticoid therapy. Another cause is when a person was treated for Cushing syndrome and a tumor secreting ACTH in the pituitary or cortisol in the adrenal gland gets removed. Both glucocorticoid therapy and a tumor secreting cortisol will lead to inhibition of the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis and, consequently, decrease natural production of CRH. But when the cause of high cortisol levels is removed suddenly, it can take more than a year for CRH production to go back to normal, resulting in adrenal insufficiency. Diagnosis is based on a combination of history, clinical findings, imaging, and serum cortisol, ACTH, and CRH measurements. Treatment is hormone replacement therapy. All right, as a quick recap. Adrenal insufficiency can be primary when the adrenal glands don't work properly or central when there's a problem with either the hypothalamus or the pituitary. With primary adrenal insufficiency, there is low cortisol, high ACTH, and no increase in cortisol level after the ACTH stimulation test. There can also be low aldosterone and high plasma renin activity. With central adrenal insufficiency, there is low cortisol and low ACTH, an increase in cortisol after ACTH administration, but no aldosterone deficiency. Central adrenal insufficiency can further be secondary or tertiary. With secondary insufficiency, there's no increase in ACTH after a CRH injection, whereas with tertiary disease, ACTH levels increase after CRH. Causes of primary adrenal insufficiency, or Addison disease, can be autoimmune, when there are anti-adrenal antibodies present, or non-autoimmune, which can happen because of adrenal infections, bilateral adrenal metastases, or hemorrhages. Secondary adrenal insufficiency is usually due to a pituitary tumor or a central nervous system tumor. Finally, tertiary adrenal insufficiency can occur either because of sudden withdrawal of glucocorticoid therapy or after the removal of a tumor causing Cushing syndrome. Primary insufficiency can cause hyperpigmentation, hypotension, hyperkalemia, and metabolic acidosis. Secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency can be associated with headaches, visual abnormalities, and hypopituitarism. Both primary and central adrenal insufficiency can present acutely as an adrenal crisis with symptoms like fever, shock, abdominal pain, and altered mental status. Treatment consists mostly of lifelong hormone replacement therapy. Now, back to our cases. Mike presents with chronic symptoms like fatigue, weight loss, and muscle pain, and a family history of autoimmune diseases. Examination reveals hypotension and skin hyperpigmentation. Together, these symptoms are highly suggestive of primary adrenal insufficiency, most likely from an autoimmune cause given his family history and the fact that he's from Canada, a high-income country. The diagnosis was partially confirmed by low serum cortisol levels, so the next step would be obtaining serum ACTH, aldosterone, and anti-21-hydroxylase antibody levels plus an ACTH stimulation test to confirm that the insufficiency is indeed primary. Teresa, on the other hand, presented with acute symptoms like vomiting, abdominal pain, hypotension, and altered mental status. Now, these are rather unspecific, but adding the fact that she underwent transphenoidal resection of a pituitary tumor and her low serum cortisol levels suggests adrenal crisis due to tertiary adrenal insufficiency. A CRH stimulation test would be needed to confirm the diagnosis. She was started on IV fluids and hydrocortisone immediately.